This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From the American Society for Microbiology, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on June 9th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are going to talk about the brand new edition, the fifth edition of the ASM textbook, Principles of Virology. And joining me are all of the authors of this wonderful book from Princeton University, Jane Flint. Hello, Jane. Welcome back. Thank you, Vincent. From Fox Chase Cancer Center, Ann Scalka. Hey, Vincent. How are you? Here we are. <laughs> this is like your fifth time on TWIV, Ann. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> also from Fox Chase Cancer Center, Glenn Raw. Hello, everyone. And uh, we have uh, a new member of the author team from the Rockefeller University, Theodora Hatsuanu. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. It's your second TWIV, I think, right? Yes, that's correct. And so hey, all of you have been on TWIV. Jane, multiple times for the book. I think this is our third textbook ed- edition, right? It is, but I've only ever been on for the book. Right. Is that is that is that a uh, judgment actually? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I was, it's, it's interesting though when I listen. I think Kathy has taken on my book role, right? When she I has. listen to your regular twiv, so I enjoyed that a lot. You know, I have to tell you, Jane. I was writing a grant with uh, Amy from my lab, and she had it's a coronavirus grant application, and she wrote coronavirus transcription, and I changed it to RNA mRNA synthesis, and she said. I'm not Jane Flint. Leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, well, it's in the throughout the textbook. It's not transcription for RNA viruses, but that's actually kind of you know what I tell my students whenever I teach. When you write a textbook, what you say in the first chapter has to mean the same as in the last chapter. So you have to define everything. You can't use different terms, which scientists are often uh, want to do. So, uh, and as l- listeners may know. Yeah, from listening to uh, to Wiv and and uh, Kathy, we have precise language in the book, right? Yes, absolutely important, actually. Otherwise, you get confused about what you're talking about yeah. or thinking about it, which is even worse. But as you know, we do define things that differ from most from many virologists, right? So we don't use transcription for RNA viruses. But if you talk to a virologist, they say, "Oh, how can you do that? It must be transcription, right?" <laughs> Well, look in our book. That's how we do it. Uh, anyway, Jane, we should have you on. Just talk about science one day. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Well, it's, you know, I don't do much active science anymore, do yes, I? But you did for many years and you I did. Probably and I rem- do know I do. I did through, live through and work through a lot of really interesting yeah. virological history. And, exactly. and with you were there for some of it. Some of it. Remember? But, but yes. The MIT days. I think that's worth uh, recounting because everyone... Not everyone. Many people forget history. Yeah. And it's really, I love hearing stories about old discoveries in virology. I think it's so inspiring, right? Yeah. And so we have, so yes, we will have you come and talk about uh, those days. But today we're going to talk about the book. And let's start with our new uh, author, Theodora, um, who just joined us. And first, give us a little bit of your history. Uh, tell us where you're from and educated and trained and so forth. Uh, so I'm Greek. I come from Rhodes Island, which is uh, not so small in terms of Greek islands, but actually rather small. Uh, and it's the island of the sun. So it's, it used to be a, apparently a huge power back 2,400 years ago. <laughs> and uh, so I think I, I recounted this story in my previous mm-hmm. uh, in the previous episode, but um, uh when I was growing up, there was not a lot of biochemistry. In fact, there was no biochemistry at all in Greece. And for some reason, it sounded really fascinating to me. So I thought I'm going to go and tr- give it a try. And it just so happened that Greece had joined the EU. So I was able to go study wherever I wanted without having to pay the exorbitant fees that foreigners had to pay. So I decided to go to England and I went to Bristol University and got my degree in biochemistry. Um, 
it didn't go very well. I didn't like, I didn't enjoy the very rigid book-based teaching of biochemistry. The, we did have practicals, but they, it was not extensive. And also, I didn't study, so I didn't do very well. <laughs> and then after three years, I decided um, I have to find out whether I really like this or not. So I went to do a master's at Imperial, and that involved a really extensive, um, so that's Imperial College in London, and that involved a really extensive uh, practical during the summer months. And you would go to really um, experience what it was like working in, a, in an academic environment. And I thought I did very well during my master's in contrast to my BSc. So uh, I thought, oh, yeah, maybe this is really um, worth pursuing. But again, I, I didn't get a feel for what it would be like to work in the lab full time. So I applied uh, for a technician position and I was very lucky because I was uh, I got a position with Robin Weiss and Thomas Schultz, which were at the time at the Cancer Centre in uh, Kensington in London. And I uh, had a technician position working on HTLV1 envelope glycoproteins. And uh, then uh, at the same time, it was when Kaposi sarcoma was discovered, uh, not by Robin's lab, um, but uh, we were working on it. And through some connections in Greece, I managed to get them a lot of uh, samples because it's endogenous in, some, in certain areas of uh, the Philippines. And uh, we verified that all those samples were indeed positive for this new virus. And uh, those were my first publications. And, but apart from the actual research, I actually loved working in the lab. It was just, I realized that this was amazing and I could not believe that someone would actually pay me to do this type of work. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, I want to stay. And I need a PhD. And uh, Robin's lab was great because he had really fantastic people from all over the, uh, Europe working there and passing through, doing sabbaticals. So that's where I met my um, PhD mentor, François-Louis Cosset, who was just returning to France to start his own lab. And he offered me a place, he said, why don't you come and do your PhD in France? And I thought, why not? Let's go. So I went and worked on gene therapy for four years uh, during my PhD and it was, I mean, yeah, it continued. I continued enjoying it. And then at the time it was very clear that uh, you had to do a postdoc in the US. Uh, it was just it's the best research. And so I came over and worked with Steve Goff for a year or two, it's where we first met. And uh, then uh, at the same time, I had already met Paul and uh, Paul Binash, my husband, and he, was, he had started his own lab at the Iron Diamond, uh, which is now your neighbor, but used to be down near uh, Bellevue. And um, at some point, we talked about science at home all the time, okay, all the time. And um, I really wanted to work on HIV and Steve at the time was somewhat reluctant to work on HIV. At the same time, Paul had just started his lab, so he had a really hard time getting postdocs. <laughs> so we decided uh, we should try working together, and uh, we did. And uh, I think it was about a year, a year and a half. We fought constantly, <laughs> constantly. Uh, yeah, we would that. <laughs> yes, we would start the argument in the lab, and of course, we would return home and we could just keep going and going and going. But eventually, we figured out how how to work together, and we've worked together ever since. Hmm. How long have no you? More argument? <laughs> oh, constantly, still constantly. <laughs> no, that's good. Is it about fifty fifty? Who wins? Who wins? <laughs> uh, is it winning or coming to some resolution? It's not. It's come, yes. yes. I, yes. I would say it's, it's yes. more coming to a mutual agreement rather than yeah. winning. Yeah. Yeah. No, none of us will admit losing. So <laughs> you're not going to get a straight answer for that. It must have been exciting working in uh, Robin's uh, lab. He's such a, he's such a, uh, Pioneer in the in the um, area, yes. It, yes. and he's such a fantastic guy. 
It was yeah. amazing. It was amazing. I mean, of course, at the time, I mean, I was remember, I was brand new. I had not done virology before. I didn't even realize who he was. I didn't realize that everybody who's anybody in in England and has worked in that lab. And yeah. so it was only after I left that I was like, oh wow, that was really a uh, good choice. Me. No, it was great. Yeah, and he had. I mean, and because of the. Um, because of Robin, I mean, Robin is wonderful, really nice, uh, always took time to talk to people, always interacted with everyone in the lab, from technicians to uh, other scientists, uh, staff scientists and uh, visiting professors. It was a great environment. And he had, of course, he attracted very good people. So it was really nice working with all these uh, uh, virologists, like, like Thomas, like uh, uh, Paul Clapham, um and uh um chris boshoff joined when i was big i mean it was just amazing it was really amazing so how long now have you been at rockefeller uh we only moved in 2017 so uh it's been three years now i remember so we we asked you to join because a previous author lynn enquist uh left and i remember Glenn and I met you for dinner mm-hmm. in New York. You wanted to talk about it. And, but you had already moved to Rockefeller, but it was probably recently because if it was 2017, when did we start working on this? Yeah. No, I, yes. What, it must have been either the summer, because it was summer, right? Yeah, it was, it was summer. summer. Uh, might have been the summer that we moved. Yeah. Or the summer, right? I think it must have been. Yeah. Yeah. We've been working on this a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good point. The, the previous edition, the fourth edition, was published in 2015, correct? Correct, yes. Mm-hmm. And so we started working on this in 2018? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. And now it's... It maybe I think even before, before. the fall of 2017, because, wow. you know, remember, we have to have all those meetings yeah. to look at what I think we'll talk about that a bit more later about how we want to yeah. revise and so on. Yeah. And now it's 2020. So it will be five years when, yeah. when between editions, which is about right. Yeah. So I want, I wanted to ask you, Theodora, you were pretty early on in your career. This was a, a big task to undertake. What were your thoughts and wh- why did you end up joining us? Well, first thought is why on earth did they ask me? <laughs> I mean, as you said, I mean, you and Jane and Anne, I mean, Glenn is, Junior, junior to you at least, but I think Thank you this. So much, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, you yeah, know, I was, um, uh, yeah, uh, I was a bit blown away to be honest, mm. and uh, and saw that, yeah, um, I, and remember, I think I expressed to the, my one of the concerns is that I'm probably the, yeah, I am the only non-English native speaker. I mean, I, I learned English at a very young age, but uh, I still make mistakes. Do you like to correct me <laughs> in my emails? I, I don't. Are, are your mistakes in the English, Theodore? I don't think so. I recently I corrected think, her. Yeah, I, I think did. they're. Um, you know, you got a bit stuck in jargon, right? I. Uh, <laughs> I don't think your English is wrong. Very often, maybe. Oh, very, thank you, Jane. That means a lot. Coming no, from really. You. I know really, there was that really. phrase that Vincent corrected in an email, but that's. You know, that's a, what is it, Coll- colloquialism, right? I was thinking yeah. about how you write, you know, mm. your grammar and your words. Well, and yes. I mean, I have, I have uh, improved over the years. Paul has been very good at uh, helping me improve because uh, he writes English education. Well. Mm. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, so I was, I was very worried. I was very worried that I would do a good job. And I would, uh, you would all think that, oh, why on earth did you invite her to join? That was the biggest mistake we ever made. So but, actually, um, you, know, you were, you were our first choice. Mm-hmm. And so when Vincent and I came in uh, to take you out to dinner, we were, we were full court pressed to try and be persuasive yeah. to you. Um, did you leave that dinner certain that you would do it? Or were you still uncertain or hesitant, or did you have questions after um, we tried hard to persuade you? No, you were very. It was very. I remember the dinner. It was very nice, and you had answered all my questions. You were very uh, persuasive. I was not a hundred percent decided then. I, I still 
um, as you said, it's uh, I, I still uh, my research is extremely active, so I still have a lot of things to do, and and taking on a, a book is I still it, it's. I know Glenn, Glenn was really very clear about how much time it was going to take. And even so, I still found it uh, overwhelming. I think uh, in the end, uh, the idea that I would do, uh, I would, uh, maybe work on less chapters as restructuring the entire thing. And uh, I, I think it took me a, couple, a month after that, because I remember I sent an email to... Um, Vincent uh, from Rhodes. I was on holiday with the kids, and and I really. Uh, that's when I when I made up my mind. I sent the email immediately because in the end it was just. I, uh, it was a unique opportunity to contribute to this book, so I couldn't. Yes, it was, I could not say no. Oh, we're we're happy you joined us, and uh, yeah. uh, I guess you don't regret it, right? You've probably learned a lot. Yes. No, of course I don't regret it. It was a fantastic experience. I, I've really enjoyed our meetings over the last two years. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. There were times, I think, I regretted. The entry chapter, I uh, was working on the entry chapter, was I found that hellish. It was mm -hmm. really a lot of work just because the scope is so enormous. And... Uh, so no, no, I don't, I don't. And in the beginning, I always, I always remember starting to work on the first chapter and thinking um, I was very hesitant. I didn't change anything. <laughs> I would change a little word here, a little bit there, change the definition, and, and then I finished and I thought, I'm sure that's not what they want from me. <laughs> I better do a better job. Mm. So then I rewrote the whole thing. And once you start editing, you just you just go. I was... I had the, when I joined the fourth edition, I had exactly the same feeling because I inherited a lot of Lynn's chapters. And I had such high regard for Lynn Enquist. And so I thought, what possibly am I going to do exactly. or change about the chapter? And even when I looked through them, all the information was there. But then when it was my job to start editing them, I thought, well, this, this doesn't belong here. And the moment you begin moving things around, it all it, it's not that it falls apart, but you have your own particular way that you want to tell the story mm -hmm. and things that you want to emphasize. And um, there was, for example, a lot of herpes virus in the chapters that I inherited from Lynn because that's the stuff that Lynn knew well. And I'm an RNA virologist. So we titrated out a little bit of the herpes and we put in a little <laughs> bit more of the RNA virus. And so, you know, you realize however, however um, global we tried to be in writing these chapters, and unbiased in our viewpoint about particular, you know, theories, or we certainly try to exclude our own science as much as possible from them. Um, you you have to have some bias and some viewpoint. Yeah, oh, that's, yes. that's scientists are all about that, right? <laughs> uh, so yes, we love what we do. <laughs> yeah. We love the viruses. Yes. <laughs> I think uh, writing a book is a unique opportunity to influence a lot of new people and maybe change the minds of people in the field. So, uh, No, I, yes, absolutely. That's my next point, that this is, this is something more. And it, the, the scope and the uh, sometimes the feeling that, you know, maybe this young kids thinking about virology are going to read this book and it's going to influence people in this way. It's just yeah. incredible. So that's a good time to talk about what's new in this edition. You know, it's five years. Obviously, things have changed. But let's tell you about some of the specific uh, things. Maybe you could start, uh, Glenn. What's new in this edition? Sure. One thing that we added this time that I was um, very, very enthusiastic about, so I kind of coordinated, but I think all of us fully agreed. When we write this book, um, it's not – I don't – think for any of us is this a vanity project. We are sincere in wanting to communicate core principles and get people not just educated but excited about this field. Um, and so therefore, ensuring that it targets and is accessible to the readership that we um, you know, uh, have is fundamental. So we thought 
um, it might not be a bad idea to go to some of our clients, some of the people who actually have purchased and who've used our text, some of the students, graduate students, undergraduates, some postdocs, um, and um, invite them to review some of our chapters. So what we did is we gave out, we uh, gave them a list of all the chapters. Um, I asked them to identify chapters that they would be particularly interested in reviewing, perhaps things that were um, similar to the research that they're doing themselves. Um, they got those chapters and we asked for as rigorous a review as possible. What did you like? What didn't you like? What was poorly explained? Which, you know, what things do you think were omitted that you would want more information about or to be included? All of those were um, sent in to me and they were animized. So we didn't know, because some of them were art students from, from Rockefeller or from Princeton or um, uh, from Columbia. So um, we wanted to ensure that the students didn't feel that there was any possible possibility of uh, blowback for them. So we sent out those reviews very similar to a, a standard peer review process. And as we were building our chapters for the fifth edition, all of these reviews were sort of right next to us as we were going through them to ensure that we accommodated or we thought about all of the suggestions that were made. And I venture to say that a good bit of what has changed about this fifth edition was as a consequence of uh, the opinions of our student reviewers. I, I feel like this is a real strength of the book because um, they had lots of nice things to say about the fourth edition, but they also had really strong suggestions for us as well. Um, in addition to that, we were able to allow a few of the students, once we had written the chapters for the new edition, based on some of their comments, um, we had a few of our sessions in which we had some of those students come back and participate in our readings, which I suspect we'll talk about um, at some point soon, um, so they could actually see the whole process of how one chapter morphs and changes mm -hmm. into another for a new edition. So. Um, so probably about 30 students um, who participated in this. They're all going to be acknowledged in the text, and, and they deserve that because it was a, a, a lot of work on their part, and it was hugely helpful for us. I think, I think they enjoyed also coming to, to our readings. They found it eye-opening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they turned out to be more spicy than you might think they are. Yeah. Right? I was just thinking, trying to remember which <laughs> I don't do it. Did we, for those, did, did we behave any better um, when we had uh, observers than normally? I, I don't think we did. I think no, we, didn't. Really un, we didn't. We didn't. You. Are you saying we misbehave? <laughs> we, we we bicker. We do bicker. We do bicker. Yeah, we we have we have arguments are we because grumpy? we're are we grumpy? <laughs> <laughs> Some are more grumpy than others. <laughs> <laughs> yes, especially when we're especially when we're hungry. When we're hungry, Anne. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> it be five thirty rolls along, and Anne is. Well, when are we going to dinner? <laughs> You're like I remember that from the very first retreat we did. Uh, what else is is new, Jane? Do you want to tell us something else? Um, yeah, we could talk about the new chapter. We seem mm -hmm. to manage to have a new chapter with every edition. And I think um, it, it was thinking about the timing because people have been thinking about using using virus and their properties like the ability to enter cells, take in genetic information for medical applications, I think since the development of cloning and so-called recombinant DNA technology. But actually I was reviewing in my mind at least the approvals in this field, which have taken decades and decades to get here. And it turns out, with the exception of one oncolytic virus, all of um, our vehicles that have been approved in this country and or uh, Europe have come since the last edition, 2015. And I know we don't have a lot. Uh, we have probably less than 10, but we do have actually, I believe, four gene therapies, which are actually designed to um, deal with um, genetic deficiencies that have been approved. A couple directed at um, killing tumor cells by redirecting T cells and, and one oncolytic virus in this country. And I think it, there are two vectored vaccines. Is that right, Vincent? Yeah, there's, there's Ebola and... Yeah. Um Dengue. De dengue dengue vaccines are both yeah. vector, and those are both very recent too, aren't they? Yeah, they're both. So right. I think it adds up to about nine or ten if we count the Chinese oncolytic virus. But those nine have all happened since the last edition. So it seemed the time was really now ripe to talk about 
how we can turn viruses to therapeutic purposes. And it was really nice because we could also begin by looking at the long history of phage therapy, which actually mm. goes back right to the beginning or close to the beginning of virology and the discovery of bacteriophages. So I think that's an important and interesting addition. And it, it's sort of slightly different from the rest of the book, but it matches, I think, in the sense that we talk about you know, the fundamentals of, of virus reproduction. And although we only focus on a relatively small number of viruses in this new chapter, you can see how those principles play out into using them for therapeutic benefit. So that's one. Um, so that's called therapeutic viruses, right? Yes. I, I like it. And Jane, did you, did you want to mention also what was unique about it in terms of how it was written? Yeah. I was, say. Um, I, was, I was going to say that because we don't normally discuss who does what, but I think it's fair to say we can <laughs> tell everyone this is the only chapter ever to which, for which everybody has written something, a section, right? And then we, re, we reintegrated it at, or integrated as we read it. Yeah. Right. That was fun. It was fun it was, to do that. It was good. Yeah. 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 And, and Jane is the taskmaster who emails us and says, You're, you haven't contributed your part yet, please write. Or, no, or we, when we have to go through the editing, we have to do it in the order of the sections. Yeah, that's always fun. So that, um, that, but that, another thing, sorry, go ahead. That, that chapter for me was useful because for a few years now, I've had a, a lecture in my course about that. And then now this made it formal with wonderful diagrams that I could use in the lecture. So this year I used it at the end of the spring course. It was great. Yeah. I really liked it. And it was, it was very nice for me too, because I don't... You, no one knows. Well, you guys probably know. But I've been teaching um, the only biotechnology course that's taught at Princeton in our department. And it's a bit more, um, much more molecular genetic than any course that's taught in um, civil and biological engineering. So I get a lot of students from that. So it was very nice to bring my experience mm -hmm. of watching how things have changed in the last what, 12 years I've been teaching this course into the book, uh, into that chapter. Another thing... Sorry, Cathy. I was going to say that it was it was great for me because we went back to my PhD yeah. gene therapy, very early mm -hmm. vectors, MLV based vectors. The HIV uh, vectors had just come out when I was doing my PhD, so it was very nice to see. Oh yeah, I know, I remember those papers. And now, of course, with all the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development, you can just look at that chapter and understand many of the vectors and how they work. It's a good time. We have all the major ones, right? The yeah. apnea, which the Oxford one, of course, is tri um, chimpanzee, but fine. Yeah. Um, we, I believe we touch on mRNA. And I don't know, someone doing a, a VSV-based one? Sure. sure. Yeah, I think that one would be yeah. helpful. Yeah. You're, you're doing that, Theodore? Not exactly. Okay. Oh. Uh, we do have, we have also made, uh, actually, the paper just got out on bioarchives today. Um no, it's not. The other one's actually. Sorry, it's going to be on Biarchives tomorrow. We've made a recombinant VSV that expresses the uh, SARS-CoV-2 right. spike. Yes. Glenn, you were going to say something recently. Uh, no, it's simply that um, it was fun to write this um, as the group because that whole point that I mm. made before about us having our own perspectives and um, not biases, but our own viewpoint mm -hmm. of how we want to craft the chapter. Yeah. We really had to work quite well as a team. And in fact, it was one of the last chapters that we wrote, I mm -hmm. think um, in part because we were all very busy with our own, but also in part because I think it almost required us being having a little bit of a hive mind to make sure that we knew what direction we wanted that chapter to go. Yeah. Yeah. And as Jane said, we each do, we each write, a certain number of chapters, but we won't tell you who wrote what, and maybe you could guess that actually. But the the writing is also, I think, the writing is quite similar among all the chapters. But there are some styles that you might detect in others. So maybe you could, maybe listeners could check it out and <laughs> Offer see some suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> that that will have a bit. If they want to play the game, I can give them a clue. I absolutely did not write the structure chapter. So. <laughs> Yes, indeed. No, but I, I really don't think that people realize how much time we spend on this book. Because whenever I talk to and describe the process, they are always um, uh, surprised at the way we do it. So that we have read every chapter all together twice, at least twice, some more than mm -hmm. twice. And we discuss and debate 
from sentences to com commas to uh, ideas. I mean, everything is its really a collective effort. I think that's why it's, it would be difficult to say, yes, so-and-so wrote this chapter and so-and-so right. wrote this mm -hmm. cha that chapter. And then after we write it, another a person edits it again. So, it, I mean, there is no, I don't think, I don't know that other books are written this way. But No, in fact, that's, should be. <laughs> that's why uh, we met every month really right yes yes for at least a day and sometimes several to to read through all of this and uh, i think it makes a big difference as we've said for previous editions when you read something aloud that you've written or hear someone else reading it you really pick up where it doesn't mm -hmm. work <laughs> at all and you can fix it i think that really helps so theodora there are some um some new things about the appendices that you're involved in right the appendix, no, it was mainly the uh, volume appendix two appendices. Two. That was uh, Glenn mainly. Uh, so you did, I thought you what? did volume one appendix, no? I did, but it, that, that has not changed much except the, I said details and updates that have occurred in the last okay. five years. But I think the the one that has a completely new look is appendix okay. volume two. So tell us about that, Glenn. So, um, at the end of each of the two volumes, at the end of volume one, is an appendix that discusses each of the virus families in terms of replication strategy, genome organization, um, proteins that the viruses make. So very much of molecular biology analysis of, of the virus families, particularly the ones that we discuss extensively in the text. In the end of um, volume two, we do something similar, but in this case, it's all about the kinds of diseases that they cause chiefly in humans, because most of the viruses that we focus on are ones that impact um, human health. Although we do, um, I think, have more in this edition about bacterial viruses, plant viruses, um, viruses that, that are you know, broader than just those that impact um, humans and other animals. Um, the, the volume two appendix is fully uh, revised. So in addition to it looking differently and now having information where you would expect it, there's also much more information about epidemiology, um, geography, um, of where these viruses arise, when during the year they arise, um, and also uh, much more about pathogenesis in their natural hosts. Uh, so the uh, illustrations for this, which are done by uh, Patrick Lane, who is our the sixth member of this team, our illustrator for the book, which are just all outstanding. But um, I think that's a substantial difference. And it's a nice compliment to the rest of the book because um, as perhaps we'll talk about, the whole way in which the book is written is principle-based. So each chapter doesn't focus on a particular virus with one exception. Uh, no, none of the chapters focus on one particular virus. They focus on an aspect of viral replication or of immunity. Um, this appendix is a nice complement because if you want to just look at, let's say, coronaviruses and understand their distribution, their pathogenesis, um, their nomenclature, um, there's now um, a, a, a good source uh, to access that information. And is there anything new that you can think of that uh, is in this edition? No, uh, I can just say that uh, uh, we have uh, always tried to include uh, information about phages, mm. which of course were the, uh, the, my beginning and the beginning, I think, of virology uh, as a uh, uh, a quantitative science, and I had a lot of fun doing the uh, doing that section in the therapeutic viruses on phage therapy. Uh, it's been in the news lately. Uh, a, a few really spectacular <clears throat> examples of the of the use of phage therapy, and I think most people don't realize that uh, not only are the phages themselves important, but <laughs> their products are important. So there's a now, an increased uh, use of phage lysins uh, in food production, and um, people are even thinking about using phages for vaccines. So it's mm. uh, so that part was a lot of fun, and I think uh, uh, people will enjoy reading that section uh, because there's a lot of history there. Yeah, the the, uh, the thing we're not mentioning, of course, is that every chapter is updated, yeah. right, extensively. Yes. So Jane, yes. There is one other new thing. Um, uh -huh. 
completely new. That is the, finally at last the addition of study questions That's or right. puzzles. Right. 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 Yeah. And I can't remember. I mean, we finally think we've been thinking about trying to do it and never quite managed to achieve it because we're always, you know, pushing yeah. to get this finished. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how, who, I guess we all agreed that this finally we should do it. And I know Vincent was helpful. He put up some of his questions from Columbia or, and Glenn was mm -hmm. great at making crossword puzzles, right? Oh, should I say that? <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't the only one. No, he had the idea of using uh, crosswords, right? So yeah. where, 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 if someone wants to adopt the book to teach, where do they find the answers? to? Yes, that? well, we haven't sorted that out yet. Yes. We have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to talk to, I guess, Christine or someone. Right. Uh, so I, I thought we'd talk just a few minutes on how we update. Um, yeah. You know, Anne, you were really good at updating your chapters. How do you do it? How do you go about it? Oh, gosh. Well, looking at new papers, mm -hmm. uh, that's the only way to do it, actually. And uh, and trying to find out what's new and what's changed and what new concepts to include. So um, that's that's the way to go about it. Um, yeah, there isn't there isn't a uh, an alternative. No, I think perhaps we I mean, I don't know about everyone else, but in the intervening years when we're not working on it, I think we will probably collect up sure. relevant papers and I have these huge, you know, folders on my desktop <laughs> yeah. and then sort them out and figure out which is, you know, important, which is detail. But you also have to remember before any of us start actually doing a revision in writing, we all sit and we don't read the uh, mm. old chapter, but we look at it and I think the person who's going to be in charge of doing the revision has ideas but everybody contributes to yeah. what we might want to yeah. add what we should take out which boxes yeah. no longer are relevant or never really worked in the first place so yes. there's a lot of joint input i think before we yes. even start right yes and yes. then and that that was very helpful for me particularly because i just do it for the first time and i didn't have to decide all by myself what to leave and what to take out but we actually mm. discussed yeah uh, yeah, what uh, needs uh, to change. That's a good point that we don't just add material each edition. We have to take some out. Other, take some out. Yes. Otherwise <laughs> the book would get huge, right? Right. And uh, some some things uh, are no longer principles and uh, other themes, things don't seem relevant anymore. And yeah, we're, yeah. we have to be ruthless. Otherwise the yeah. book would get well, too Vincent, big. how do you update chapters? So I basically use my blogging and podcasting as a guide because for those I pick topics that I think have a broad interest and are, and are principle-based. And so I go back to my blog posts and look at uh, what, and in fact, some of those end up in the textbook, modified. It's always funny to me where I have a blog post and then I put it there and you guys will, will fix it in ways that I never thought <laughs> to do. <laughs> I go, wait, I thought this was good. <laughs> we make it better. <laughs> we make it better. And then the podcast, <laughs> podcast two, we pick papers that have broad relevance and which go well. And so I just go back and look at episodes for ideas. And that, you know, it's, it's yeah. again, looking at the literature, but in a different way. Yeah. 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 One of the very special things about being part of this book is learning from each other. And that's, uh, that's really extraordinary. And this, so this, this everybody contributing to the discussion of mm. each chapter, uh, what makes sense to them, what doesn't make sense. Uh, it's, it's really invaluable. Yes. Really. No, no I, that meeting together was great. And in fact, mm -hmm. when we could no longer meet because of the, the pandemic, it was, it was, we did some meetings on Zoom, I guess, but it was sad not to be able to do that because it's fun because not only do we work all day, we go out to dinner and we continue talking and uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I, now, what, what was unusual about this edition is that uh, we're almost done. Yeah. And then we have a brand new coronavirus emerging and causing a pandemic. And that, for us, raised the issue, what do we put in? And it was hard because a lot of the chapters were finished. They were in galleys already. And I have to say that I had several cases where I had the copy edited in the first galley and the second. I had to change the infection numbers from one to the next yeah. until yeah. finally you say, as of this writing, this is the number. But the numbers kept going up and up. And so... We had to deal with how to, we couldn't put it all in, obviously, because we were almost done. Yeah. Glenn, how do you think we dealt with that? Particularly since a lot of the, um, a lot 
information proved uh, like a, a few weeks after to be wrong. That's right. <laughs> to be uh, something, a paper ap- appeared in bio yeah, yeah, yeah. immediately. And then uh, you figured out, said, no, that's not right. Or that is, it was, I think it would have been extremely dangerous to incorporate mm-hmm. every new piece of information about this virus and in fact, as it the, came out. This, this is, the publication about this is unprecedented, right? Because we, yes. have, yeah. we have preprints of all sorts, thousands and thousands of papers being uh, preprints coming out. It's hard to put that in a textbook. And some people may be disappointed that there's no chapter on SARS-CoV-2, but they're there shouldn't be. It's not a we principle in itself. Do we? we don't have enough yet. And it, I mean, we have an HIV AIDS chapter because 37 million people are infected and it's still an ongoing pandemic, right? And right. which many people yes. forget, by the way, I'm on many discussions yeah. about SARS CoV 2. And oh, this pan- I said, you know, there's another pandemic going on right now. But uh, we do try and put in uh, information about SARS CoV 2 when it's relevant, right? So I think in the emergence uh, chapter, we. We put some information. Glenn, do you, do you recall any instances where you? Yes. So uh, volume two, chapter one is the epidemia. It's, uh, right. I think it's called populations and epidemiology or something like that. And we <coughs> added a box. Actually, I just opened it up as we were talking about this. We added a box at the very end, which is a very different sort of box than any that we've done before. I think it's labeled as a discussion box, but it's more of a personal reflection. Yeah. And I'm just going to read the first sentence of this new box, uh, the title of which is This Moment in Time, the SARS-CoV-2 Pandemic. And as I wrote, it's 5.31 a.m. on Sunday, March 1st, 2020. And 12 hours ago, the first death in the United States was conver- confirmed from the pandemic coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. And so we, I think we all agreed that this was a, an uh, opportune time because this was such an early stage, at least in the United States, for this pandemic. And you could see the storm coming, right? You knew the, how much worse it was going to get. And there was, a, even as I looked over it, just as I opened it up just seconds ago here, there is this sense of portent and of, and of fear in looking at it that I thought was important to have in the text, even though certainly now, sadly, there have been many, many more cases of uh, infections and of deaths, uh, not just in the U.S., but mm-hmm. elsewhere. Um, there was something, by capturing that moment, I think is a, a, a bit of a reminder of what we all have just, uh, or are still going through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, m- I remember Theodora saying, well, they identified the receptor, should we put that in the chapter? I said, no, it's not a principle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I, you know, don't be disappointed that there's no SARS-CoV-2 chapter, but if you read the book, you're going to learn all about SARS-CoV-2 because the principles are the same as for other viruses. You'll learn about pathogenesis. There is, in one of the chapters, all about r naught and uh, morbidity mm-hmm. and mortality rates and so forth, and that's all relevant, right? Mm, yeah. There's chapters on epidemiology, which yeah. is very relevant. Uh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, of yeah. course, there's also information on SARS-1. Right and MERS, yes. which are all all relevant to this, and and the and the component, the immunolo- immunological component of this virus is also very interesting, and and there we have several chapters that describe um, the various uh, parts of the uh, immune system, which I think are very mm-hmm. very relevant, and and it's all going to come to bear with this virus as well. Yeah, of course, vaccines chapter will teach you the mm-hmm. principles of how the vaccines are going to work, the antivirals. Should we have some one day? We'll, we'll teach you about that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, so that's a good way to, to round up this discussion. It's a book based on principles, not on viruses. There are, other, there are other books about viruses, and they do a good job virus by virus if you want to learn that. But this will teach you all about all the, all the things that go on in a virus infection, whether it's in a cell or in a host. And I, I still believe this is the best way to teach introductory virology. And I think, and all of us obviously mm-hmm. subscribe to that. Anything else? Uh, well, it it may be worth noting that it's a it's a, a bit heretical to be writing the text this way because I think the majority of other textbooks on virology, I think it's usually described as the bug parade, where you have you know <laughs> one chapter right. dedicated to hepatitis and one to influenza and one and you know that 
by parceling the information that way certainly does tell you and consolidate all the information about a particular virus in one place if you wanted to use it as that kind of resource. But as you point out, Fields does that already. So ours would just be a, you know, a sort of a sad replica of a, a, a far better encyclopedic volume. What this, what this does is it does integrate and shows you different ways by which viruses accomplish a common task, whether that's entry, mRNA synthesis, how they, um, you know, interact with the host immune response. And I think that gives a far richer um, appreciation of the field of virology, because otherwise it's just a lot of facts. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. a lot mm -hmm. of information and facts and, and keeping it all straight. By the time you get to chapter 12 in the, the bug parade kinds of books, you forget what you read in chapter three. At least in ours, there is, uh, a, by harmonizing all of these viruses, I think it gives you much more of a sense of the, uh, yeah. really fascinating ways by which these viruses have evolved to accomplish essential jobs. And also how many things we have discovered before because of viruses. Yes. In my yeah. point, Theodore, yeah. yeah. A large yeah. part of cell biology. In that last comment that I made, I do acknowledge that I have just betrayed one of our you cardinal... Did. You did. I was going to tell you <laughs> that you did a boo-boo. <laughs> right. You did and a boo-boo. Okay, it, let's never say boo boo again. And um, <laughs> just, just odd. Second um, <laughs> I have what, in case the reader's like, what did he do? Um, I ascribed action to viruses. I said, viruses have evolved to accommodate, yes. I think, something yeah. egregious <laughs> like this. That if, uh, if we were Glenn, you also together, ascribed them directed evolution. Yes, yes he said no, viruses no. just evolved. as bad. There you go. Pa and, you know, I have to say, Glenn, there were times during our reading you would say, oh, can I do this just once? And we would say, <laughs> and we would say no, you can't. But to, your, but to your credit, you had good humor and didn't argue and get mad or anything or get petulant. Right. Yeah, it's because I, I was scared. But it, this, this, is not, this is not. This is not. <laughs> trivial. This is not trivial. I think it's really important uh, sure, to, to the way you think about this. It it really warps your thinking if you if you ascribe intentions to these viruses. Yeah. Yes. Just, I'll give you an example. Bad. I had a I, I gave a lecture today. I'm teaching a summer virology course, and we're talking about particle to PFU ratio. And one of the students says, "Why?" Why does this happen? Why aren't they all perfect? Why isn't every virus infection? I said, well, that's your view. That's your human view. You know, you think I, I build a car, I build a thousand cars, they should all work, right? But that's not a virus view. That's why you shouldn't anthropomorphize. No. One reason why. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that the artwork is amazing in this book. It's mm -hmm. been mentioned that we worked with Patrick Lane, who is a wonderful uh, artist, and I use the figures in my lectures, and I always get compliments on the figures because they are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really think that's an that's an integral part of the book. Yes. The just gorgeous, full color uh, artwork that really explains important, things. Important teaching tools. Yes, absolutely. Other virologists use them too. I was very happy uh, in our virology course last year to see a lot of visiting professors using. Yeah slides from the book it's like yeah i know i recognize this one you can recognize the style very, very much so yes yeah. yeah it's good and patrick had a kind of a fascinating way because I, I said it before and i'll reiterate it he it, he's like an additional author to the yeah. to the group because you could scribble my my capacity to draw is terrible and i would i would scribble something down and i'd be like make it look something like this and it would come back and it would be almost perfect. And I had no idea how he was able to do this. I would often provide the text for him as well so that he could see what I was trying to explain and how it fit within mm. the context of the chapter. So, um, yeah, that's that. The, the figures are, are sort of drive each of these chapters. I, they're not afterthoughts where we you know, try and populate the book with unnecessary figures. I think that this is... Uh, a, a really essential component of um, the quality of the yeah, material. For sure. It does spoil you, though. Now that I'm preparing slides for this for coronavirus, it's like, oh, I wish I could just get Patrick to yes. do all this out for me, and then I would just <laughs> have my slides ready. Absolutely. No, I agree with you. I, you try and make some new images, and uh, always they're never as good as what Patrick as does. I've, I've thought of hiring him to do, to do something. <laughs> I did. Oh, you did for I your did. for your book, My right? My book. <laughs> Re, yeah. uh, uh, what, what's the name of your book? Tell us. 
discovering retroviruses. Discovering retroviruses. If you Beacons want to... in the biosphere. <laughs> yes, that's great. Wonderful. Is there anything we missed that we should cover? I think we, we've touched it all. Just... It's a two-volume book, fle right? Flexible paper. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, you should buy it. It's wonderful. Yes. It's really... Uh, and if you listen to TWIV, uh, we give some away. So you could go listen to the podcast and get a free one, maybe. If we have contests uh, after we publish them. Uh, but it's really remarkable. And it's been a great... Um, it's been a great task doing this with all of you. I, I really miss doing it because I learn a lot, and it's uh, fun. You're actually nice people. <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh, our special TWIV about Principles of Virology, Volume 5. You can find all the TWIVs at microbe.tv slash TWIV. And if you have any questions or comments, send them to TWIV at microbe.tv. So the authors on Principles of Virology, besides myself, Jane Flint from Princeton University. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Will we see you for the next edition? Undec well, Undecided? Probably, probably. From Fox Chase Cancer Center, Ann Scalka. Thanks, Ann. Thank you. Will we see you for the next edition? I think. Uh, uh, doubtful. Doubtful. <laughs> Uh, Not because you don't like it, right? No, no. We're also from Fox Chase Cancer Center, Glenn Rawl. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you, Vincent. And you also are undecided about the next edition, I believe. Um, well, we'll see. It, I'm glad it, it was a lot of work, um, but I already miss it somewhat. Mm. So I think in another <laughs> few years when, yes. when we begin to rethink it, especially given all of what's happened with, yeah, for sure. uh, with SARS, because there are going to be new principles and ideas. Um, it may be hard to say no. From Rockefeller University, Theodora Hatsuanu. Thanks, Theodora. Thank you, Vincent. Good to have you. I hope you're around for the next edition. <laughs> Let's get this one out first. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get some out next. I think that's essential. <laughs> She's always cagey. Yeah. She's always you. You, you can't no, refuse yeah, no. next time. You'll enjoy it because no, of course not. There's no, a lot no, of a lot of stuff to update for the next one, and it's only a couple of years before we have to start thinking about it, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like I said this. I mean, as you said, this was a lot of work, but this it was immensely enjoyable, and I yeah. really miss some monthly meetings, and right? Discussions. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>